Um, right, so I was kind of hoping to um, tell you about the uh, mysterious pipeline. Um, but my talk was mostly going to be about DMA buff, and it turns out there's a whole microconference about that tomorrow. Um, <laughs> so I kind, of, I kind of hastily revised this, and um, luckily there's enough issues, uh, meaning that um, I'm, I run the uh, graphics team at Calabra, and uh, the upshot of that is that the multimedia team spend a lot of time complaining at me. Um, about how all of GStreamer is literally perfect and um, it's only the entire display system that's holding them back. Um, I'd really like to fix that if only to sort of call them on it. Um, <laughs> but yeah, we'll see how it goes. So um, this is, I guess, kind of a uh, semi-constructed grab bag <laughs> of um, issues we tend to have with media. Um, yeah, when we're trying to go from uh, media decode blocks, which are typically your kind of H.264, MPEG-4, and so on, um, into overlays, which is what I just said. Um, yeah, so I mean, the, the main kind of three issues are, are format, some um, atomicity, and timing, um, which I'll cover individually. But first, the, um, the rough state of the art um, at least according to silicon vendors who will tell you how unbelievably amazing their um, hardware is and then provide you with a BSP where you're ex expected to go from OMAX into EGL image, uh, render that with GLES, or if you're lucky you might get a hacked up X11X video extension. Um, and all of these words make me very unhappy. Um, yeah, quickly, first, I probably don't have to reiterate it to most of you, but I'll do it anyway. Um, EGL is a disaster for media. Um, if you're trying to do zero copy media, uh, you tend to um, import your buffers through uh, EGL image external. Um, and one lovely, lovely bit of the external spec, which is one of those uh, times where EGL is almost on the verge of being useful, um, but then shoots itself in the foot, um, is that the only scaling modes you're allowed are linear or nearest neighbor. Um, and that is all kinds of not good enough for video. Um, especially when your overlays tend to have this kind of amazing uh, scaling and filtering that looks absolutely gorgeous in terms of video quality. Um, yeah, you don't want to do nearest neighbor. Um, EGL doesn't give you any timing information. You just kind of throw some frames at EGL. They appear on the screen at some arbitrary point and you hope that um, it's almost good enough and that you're almost within AV sync. And um, yeah, typically your GPU just will not be good enough at doing uh, color, conversion, color conversion and filtering. Um, all the overlays are hugely optimized for this, and in terms of visual quality, there's just no comparison whatsoever. So that's why we try to avoid it. Um, if anyone suggests you rendering video with GLESS, um, I would really like you to kindly suggest it's not a great idea. Right, so now we've decided to use overlays, planes, sprites, or cursors, um, and I think there's some other terminology I'm missing out there, but pick any of those four names. Um, how do we actually go about doing that, and what are the problems we end up facing? The first problem is format negotiation. Um, on the face of it, it seems pretty easy. You have a format, job done. But our typical pipeline uh, will involve uh, sourcing from V4L, going through GStreamer and going to DRM. Um, V4L gives you a 4CC uh, for a format code, uh, just uh, four ASCII characters. DRM gives you a different set of 4CC codes. There is some amount of overlap, um, but that seems to be more coincidence than anything. Um, and then GStreamer uh, gives you an ASCII MIME type as well as a 4CC. Um, as for Wayland, uh, its buffer allocation and transfer is actually 
not part of the core protocol. Um, so if you've got a DRM KMS based system, uh, you'll be using an extension called WL DRM, which uses uh, DRM 4CC. And similarly, whatever hardware you have, uh, whatever framework that's using, uh, the Wayland protocol will tend to reflect that format. And where this kind of falls down, um, every vendor tends to have at least six uh, tiled planar YUV formats. Um, my favorite vendor, um, who some of you in the room may recognize this, um, has a media decode block which outputs uh, one tiled planar YUV format and a display overlays which only understand another kind of tiled planar YUV format. Um, so you can create two formats for the same system, but it's kind of useless since you can't actually connect them together at all. Um, I was very happy when I found that out. Um, but since everyone tends to do it, there's not really a good way to actually describe the format. Um, similarly, uh, we, tend to, we tend to say, okay, this is YUV, it's so many bits per pixel, it's subsampled at two by two or what have you. Um, and one of the things you missed out is the YUV range. Um, so you'd think that being eight bits per channel um, for both of luminance and chrominance, um, that would be zero to 255. Um, but broadcast TV actually requires something like 16 to 235. Um, and I haven't seen anything in any of the frameworks which actually expresses that uh, clamping. Similarly, uh, you've got RGB color spaces, so uh, things like sRGB or any of the other more esoteric ones. To be honest, that's not so much of an issue um, if we're talking about media. I mean, there's an entire continent of people who've been raised on NTSC, so color accuracy obviously isn't that important, really. Yes. <laughs> I love this country. Um, but yeah, the, the MIME type uh, ends up actually being really handy for these because rather than trying to cram every constraint into uh, your four bytes of 4CC, uh, um, it's really easy to just throw on those additional tags and uh, constraints. That's what I think anyway. Um, the downside to implementing that in the kernel though is that it doesn't uh, nicely uh, drop into a UN32. So you end up uh, trying to pull strings out of user space and that's probably quite hairy. All right, so yeah, atomicity. Um, the primary use case for this, or at least the sort of most obvious one, is um, if you've got a web page with embedded video and you scroll your web page, uh, the classic X11 approach is for the web page to move quite smoothly and then the video to jump up, almost following it later on. Um, we want that to be totally atomic. Um, so in Wayland, uh, Pekka, another guy from Calabra and myself, uh, worked on a subsurface protocol uh, whereby you can lock a surface tree and keep those updates completely atomic. So in this case, the, uh, the browser would lock the surface tree um, and it would make sure that the subsurface was moved at the same time that the new content was posted. Um, similarly, if you're resizing, uh, there's all kinds of negotiation comedy that goes on where you wait until everyone in your entire window tree has resized, redrawn, and you've got the right content before you push it up. Um, yeah, Rob wrote nuclear page flip. Um, I know it's a thing that exists. <laughs> I'm not particularly clear on the, uh, what's happening with that and sort of where it's going. Um, it hasn't been merged. It's been through a few review cycles. Um, and the Android guys, uh, rather than trying to push that forward, uh, wrote another, I think it's Atomic Display Framework, is it? ADF? Um, which, yeah, that's going to be discussed more tomorrow. Um, I'm not the resident expert in the room here, so I'll probably just stop speaking about that. <laughs> um, one of the really, really, really crucial ones uh, for us is timing, um, in particular frame timing. Um, and that breaks down into three areas. Um, we want 
queuing, so we want timing for future targets. We want feedback on when our frames actually hit the screen. And end time domains actually turns out to be a massive pain. Um, the same multimedia guy who uh, continuously winters at me about the display subsystem, um, uh, pretty much every time I see him, he reminds me that um, there's a broadcast TV spec uh, which does give you a bit of leeway in terms of frame accuracy and AV sync. Um, that leeway is that you're allowed to miss one frame every 24 hours. Um, and, you know, this obviously isn't something that's really happening on consumer hardware with a massive non real time consumer stack, but it's, you know, nice to kind of aspire to it and say that we at least did our best. <laughs> um, but yeah, so having that precision is really, really important. Um, and yeah, AV sync as well. It's hugely frustrating when it's out. So the kind of front loaded approach is uh, queuing where, yeah, you up front, you provide a list of um, future frames and their target time. So you know, display this frame at this time, followed by this frame at this time, so on and so forth. Um, that's you know not not sort of too difficult from the outset. Um, one kind of hairy uh, bit you do need is the ability to cancel future flips. Let's say, all right, you know I've actually switched channels or I've resized. Um, so cancel all of these flips and then uh, feed back with an event uh, letting you know what actually got displayed and then what got discarded so you can get those frames back out. Um, alternately, instead of cancelling, uh, you could go for an approach where you uh, submit a new list of frames uh, which kind of supersede or revise the existing. Yeah? Okay. <laughs> Sorry? Um, I think I've finished explaining. <laughs> yeah. on, a vi on a video consumer hardware on the desktop, mm -hmm. you cannot revise it. You can do a new page flip but you, with immediate mode set, but you cannot cancel the old ones and it gets really hairy if you try. So. Okay, okay. Yeah, some NVIDIA hardware, you, uh, you actually aren't able to revise a list of page flips once you've submitted them, apparently. No. It's, it's not unique there. There's um, some set-top box hardware uh, I've worked with or sort of generic media targeted where, yeah, you, you can submit a list of frames, but once you've done that, you can never cancel them. But for the, yeah, for GPUs where you'd implement this by catching a timer and waking up in kernel space and uh, bashing the registers, it mm. would work for that. Yeah, but... NVIDIA is using the hardware to queue, so you can cancel the most newest flip so mm -hmm. by doing another flip and then setting the interval to immediate, but you can cancel the old ones. Okay. Fair enough. So I think yeah, that should be... <laughs> I mean, there's other complications queuing up on the kernel side if you want to do a mode set, because now you have to unwind that halfway applied sure, sure. queue of states. Uh, yeah, the mostly like been the reason why we've wanted to do the queuing in user space yep. or the queuing deep deeper than a level one, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, like I said, it sort of turns out to be surprisingly hairy. Uh, Hans? I was just wondering, um, cancelling frames, who, who, mm -hmm. where do you get that request from? Uh, the request... I, I have, we never, in Video for Linux at least, we never, it would be trivial to implement, I think, cancelling uh, frame, already queued frames there. Um, I'm just wondering what was the use case, we never had requests like that. The most immediate use case I can think of is, say you've got a, um, a video player with a reasonably uh, deep queue. Um, and then you resize the player. Uh, you want to cancel all those frames because you'll be rendering new content. Um, there are a bunch of cases, but I, I guess that's the most obvious one. Apparently, they don't use video for Linux then. <laughs> <laughs> um, right. Another 
uh, fun area, um, which is more of just an aside. Um, I recently discovered uh, some hardware gives you a carousel uh, where they have you know, a fixed number of display slots and they automatically rotate between them every 16 minutes. Um, that's a hardware thing. You cannot control that. Um, and that gets really, really uh, punitive. I mean, for, for one, you need to be queuing in advance and make sure you're a reasonable amount ahead of where the TV is. So, um, yeah, otherwise, if you miss a frame, uh, the, excuse me, the hardware's going to switch anyway. And so the visible result of that is that you'll jump backwards in time, which is pretty horrible. Um, lucky I've only come across this once, um, but you know, more fun things to think about. Um, I'm not sure how they ended up expressing that in terms of API. <laughs> um, yeah, so the, probably the most useful prior art for this is um, NVIDIA have an, oh, sorry, that says EGL NV present video. It's actually a GL extension. Um, so to uh, GLX, for X11 and WGL for Windows. Um, it's pretty hand wavy. Um, there's sort of this arbitrary uh, number of uh, video slots, they call them. Um, and it allows you to uh, schedule a future display um, on a particular slot of a number of frames with target timing ranges. Um, so you say, okay, you know, I want this frame to be displayed uh, no earlier than this time and no later than this time. Um, and the range is actually quite nice because it allows you to deal with uh, misses, you know, kind of under user spaces explicit instructions. So, you know, whether you want to um, actually just take the stutter or whether you want to um, just drop all the frames you missed out and carry on. Um, it's not actually implemented in EGL, um, but yeah, I assume this is the proprietary driver only. Android has something similar, apparently. Okay. You can EGL extension or? Okay. Okay. <laughs> Ah, uh, okay. So, <laughs> okay, but that would be for a single frame, right? For the next frame, rather than a queue. Um, but yeah, still could be handy to look at. Um, maybe you can find out tomorrow. Or <laughs> don't know. Um, yeah, neither Wayland uh, nor KMS really have anything for this. Um, intuitively, uh, looking at how nuclear page flips are being done, uh, it seems like it could actually uh, be a reasonable fit for doing the queuing uh, by stacking on some more properties. Um, but that, again, that is just off the top of my head. Um, Wayland, we actually make it fairly easy in terms of the uh, buffer handling model we've chosen uh, to implement a queue like that. Um, so that'd be, once we have the uh, support in the underlying frameworks, that'd actually be something really quite easy to, to stack on top of. Um, as you can tell, I'm sort of moderately enthusiastic about Wayland. Um, right, so the, the next part of timing is feedback, um, because we assume that we will miss more than one frame every 24 hours. Um, so in order to mitigate the impact of missing frames, we really need to get feedback from the hardware telling us uh, when our flips actually hit, uh, so we can compensate for that. And the biggest use case for this is AV sync. Um, we, GStreamer in particular, um, it does have the kind of forward-looking uh, scheduling model, uh, which works well with things like queuing. Um, but it's also very strongly driven by feedback, um, probably because it was developed under X11. So, you know, you can't assume that anything actually happened at any predictable latency. Um, so, yeah, we really, really need to get that information back from the hardware. 
Um, this is another thing EGL doesn't let you do. Um, EGL has no feedback uh, because it has no events. Um, that part of EGL is just completely missing. Um, we've got some work underway to do this in Wayland. I think it should be wrapped up and posted pretty soon. Um, and Yeah, if you're using GL to render. Remember I said it was a bad idea? Right. Um, yes, yeah, so you can do that. Even XV to some extent kind of has that, but it's not very good and it's hard to uh, drive XV in a zero copy manner. Um, DRM has V blank, v blank events, which are completely fine and exactly what we want. Um, so in Wayland, we're plumbing those through to the client. Um, but then you immediately hit the problem of which time domain do you use? Uh, because the hardware has these sort of super, super accurate clocks and will usually report back to you with page flips when it hit. Um, but the problem is you can't query those clocks. I mean, it will tell you, um, you know, this uh, frame hit at this V blank interval. Um, but you can't actually relate that to anything back on the system. Yeah? I think the best in this case is use like the same clock the kernel internally uses for DRM, which I think is a monotonic clock, and then internally convert it to the frame. Right. So, um, yeah, the some DRM drivers, um, but not entirely all, um, will convert uh, back into um, the just the standard clock monotonic, mm -hmm. um, because otherwise, you know, your those that reporting is only uh, valuable relative to anything else graphics. And if you're trying to use it for AV sync, which we are, um, then it's completely useless because you just can't relate it to anything um, unless you can query it. No. It's a different clock. I mean, w when a kernel gets an interrupt for like a V blank, mm. it also queries the timestamp for the monotonic clock. So you know from the event when the that V blank happens and when Okay. So um, you already have the time. It, you can't do that on all hardware. Um, not all display controllers will let you uh, relate uh, those timers. You also said anything that gets you a V blank should give you the. Sorry? Like a, any of the DRM drivers that support V yep. blank events. Any of the DRM drivers that support V blank events should give you the clock monotonic time. You know, yeah. plus or minus whatever interrupt latency yeah. and, and so on. As some of the some of the DRM drivers support um, a like if the hardware gives you a way to read a register to tell you how many V blanks have happened, mm -hmm. then they can give you more accurate V blank counts over a longer period without having V blank enabled the whole the time. Okay. But, right. Um, and. Yeah, I mean, most, but still not all, unfortunately, DRM drivers will give you monotonic. There's still a few broken ones, but they're mm. the exception rather than the rule. I think it would be still a lot better than what we do currently, which is do nothing at all and just hope it works. <laughs> <laughs> no argument here. <laughs> yeah. If the video source is, let's say, 23 point some fraction FPS and your display is not that. Yep. Um, what do you do? Do you, I mean, high end AV stuff does rather fancy frame rate conversion and, and interpolate the frames. Um, right. Um, to be honest, I'm not entirely sure about that. There's, um, I haven't previously dealt with hardware which would actually do that for you in any meaningful way. <laughs> so, uh, stuff like XBMC will <sighs> attempt to, or can attempt to switch mode to a, uh, to a, a mode with a VSync uh, uh, refresh rate that's closer to some nice multiple of the frame rate. Mm. I mean, it mm. depends on what your display will support and, and so on. But no. that's kind of the if you don't have uh, professional grade stuff with, that will yep. 
do the frame rate conversion. Uh, that's probably the best thing you can do. Yeah, yeah that, that's... But, I mean, a lot of the actual panel technology, they have a range of you know, frequencies they will sync at, and, and yeah. some of them you can program up you know, really quite fine-grained control over the exact um, refresh frequency you want them to run at. Yeah. Um, but I, I don't know of any way of expose it, yeah, exactly. well, but then you've got to have a mode for all of the, you know, if you've got a thousand different variations of frequency, you're going to have quite a lot of modes. Yeah, so, it's, yeah, you need some way to express a range of possible modes, but, yeah, if your user space just magically knows your hardware's like this, it doesn't, it can ignore the list of modes that the kernel gives it. Uh, and say I want this instead. Um, yeah. It's not a not a perfect solution, but yeah, yeah. No, we're we're kind of missing that in uh, in Wayland. We rather than um, yeah, as you were saying, where XBMC will change the mode to uh, get a better uh, rate, so you don't have to do frame doubling or interpretation. Um, we. Rather than having clients uh, switch the resolution in Wayland, uh, we just say, I have the client say, I would like to be full screen. Uh, we give them some scaling options if we uh, can't change the mode for whatever reason to what they want, but we don't have anything there uh, in there about refresh rate, and that would actually be really handy um, if we could avoid doing the doubling and interpretation. Um, but yeah, um, at, so most of the uh, broken drivers I was mentioning, which don't give you monotonic time, to be fair, aren't in mainline kernels, um, surprisingly. Uh, yeah, it, it would be really nice to get at hardware uh, timers just to get that extra bit of precision, but you know, this is quite hard. <laughs> Well, it depends if the hardware is a way to say it's at this scan line and it's uh, at this position in the scan line. You can tell if it's in the V blank or not. And yeah, I'm, I mean, down, some, some hardware nice. will give you enough information to work it out, but not all of it does. No, and in that case, you just fall back to the V blank interrupt for right. like, get a monotone clock time, which is still close. Yes, right but some of them won't let you query the V blank counter. Um, no, it's interrupt, so. You get interrupt when the V-blank happens, and then you do the counter from the kernel. There is some that hides it from you, though. Like, I'm not joking. It's broken enough that the only feedback you get from some of this hardware can only be related to itself. Like, no matter how you try to query, you can only end up with an approximate timing. Um, yeah. But thankfully, this isn't all hardware. <laughs> um, Right, so a couple of random uh, wild card notes. Uh, color keen um, seems to be sort of regarded as one of those unpleasant uh, throwbacks to the 90s. Um, but especially for set-top boxes where you're um, going to have uh, UI over your video almost all the time, you really, really need this. Uh, you don't want to be falling back all the time. So it can give, uh, be quite jarring. Um, that's just a random note. Um, another random note, interlaced video. Um, not really sure. <laughs> yeah, I'd, ideally it wouldn't exist. Um, but apparently interlaced 3D is a thing, um, just so you can hit bandwidth requirements. Um, luckily, again, this isn't something I've had to deal with, so happy days. Um, yeah, another wild card is sync and fences. Um, there's going to be a lot more of that tomorrow in the DMA buff sessions, which will be really good. Um, one of the things we really, really need is a way to um, query uh, from the compositor side and ideally get an event uh, for when a offense is passed, uh, because otherwise we'll uh, get a frame from a client which will actually not pass the fence for quite a while. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and it won't pass the fence for quite a while, and so that will end up blocking your entire compositor pipeline uh, just for one frame which you could have rendered later on. Carousels, yep, they're bonkers. Um, are there any other 
random questions or? We need it in KMS, and similarly, quite easy to implement. Just no one's done it. You just need to define. Yeah. Uh, for you just need need yeah. to define uh, something for that. Uh, yeah. Uh, the other thing is, if you have an overlay, a lot of these things with timing stays. You know, I, I'm biased. I would say video analytics seems to be pretty good match, actually. Fair enough. Provided <laughs> you have an overlay, you just write a video, and then it's blended. Mm -hmm. but Depends, it definitely depends on your use case. Yeah, I mean, we've definitely seen some hardware as well which has an internal RQ and DQ model which looks almost exactly like VPRLs, and that's probably not by coincidence. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, but it's something we need to work on and flesh out. Just a quick comment on formats. You mentioned that uh, four CCs are, well, they're a mess at the moment because you have a bunch of different four CCs and you're using MIME types in GStreamer. Mm -hmm. That seems to be better because they uh, can be burned. It, it's both MIME type and four CC. Right. Um, in video for Linux, we had a similar problem when describing formats that would actually go over the bus, over the physical bus, because we have like such a huge range of formats that using 4CC was a bit of a problem. So we just decided to use a 32 bit integer, and we had just a list of values. Because at the end of the day, you don't really need to see the, the uh, ASCII characters in the 4CC anyway. <laughs> so we have like a big enumeration, and we just add formats uh, as needed. Okay, yeah, that's fairly reasonable, I think, especially if you get a vendor-specific format. But yeah, cool. Thanks very much. Thanks, Daniel.